welcome to the third session of the Experience of God in Prayer. Today we'll, look, we'll be looking at two different approaches to prayer, centering prayer and praying with nature. Centering prayer was begun at the Cistercian Trappist Monastery in Spencer, Massachusetts, as a result of the liturgical renewal of Vatican II. These monks felt that that effort to, to change the liturgy had severely damaged the spirituality of Roman Catholic Church. And this was their effort to bring a spiritual awareness back into the midst of the church. Thomas Keating, one of those monks, spent decades bringing uh, centering prayer into, uh, into Christianity far beyond the Roman Catholic Church. He gathered young people around him who would continue to support it and to spread centering prayer after his death. And he made it an interreligious approach to developing a relationship with God. Praying with, praying with and through nature um, ranges from the mountaintop experiences of our lives to, to the ways that we can gain insect, insight from praying with a small object of nature as well. Both approaches move us into a more contemplative type of prayer. To begin, I'd like to read to you, um, read to you a poem by Mary Oliver called Praying. And it comes from her book of pro poems, Thirst. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention, then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. These words speak to us of the way that God can fill our hearts in centering prayer and pray with prayer with nature. And I'd like to begin talking about centering prayer. As I said a few moments ago, Thomas Keating was a monk in the Cistercian order. And one of his goals was to bring into the mainstream centering prayer, something that he wanted us to know was not just for the use of monks and nuns, vowed religious in cloistered settings, but, for, but something from which all could gain an insight into the presence of God and draw closer to God's presence. All people, he said, and we know, seek happiness through different means, through families, through relationships, through work, through objects, through gaining objects, um, through bringing things into our bodies, food, drink, and, uh, and through other methods. And he said that we are looking for happiness in the wrong place. Um, that, um, that happiness is to be found within us where Christ is. And then out of that happiness flows our relationships, our work, our service. Uh, and he tells a story of a Sufi master. The Sufi master had lost the key to his house and he enlisted the aid of his students in looking for it. And they spent um, hours looking through every blade, blade, of, blade of grass. And the heat began to beat down and it got rather unbearably hot. And finally, some, one of the students mustered up the courage and said to the Sufi master, exactly where did you lose your key? Well, the Sufi master replied, I lost it in the house. And then the student said, well, why are we looking out here? And the master said, well, there's more light out here. And as Keating tells us, we are looking for happiness in all the wrong places. The human condition in our lives today is to be without the true source of happiness, which is the experience of the presence of God, the contemplative dimension of life, and the path of increased assimilation into the joy of God's presence. The key is not outside ourselves, but it is lost. It's lost in selves ourselves, inside ourselves, and this is where we need to look to find it. 
Centering prayer is a purification of the subconscious, a time of discovering and letting go of all that separates us from God. In a sense, we're cultivating a friendship with God. And like any friendship, it takes a while. Um, it takes time to deepen, and, and it deepens slowly. Basically, in it practice, it entails practice of going into our place of prayer, to settling ourselves into prayer in the methods that we've developed and that work for us, and um, to begin to pray with our body and our senses relaxed. And then we choose a word, or we allow, we ask God to put a word into our minds. And we, pre we repeat the word slowly and steadily. And when we are distracted, we return to the word. When we are still, we sit and rest in God's presence. And then when our mind wanders, again, we return to the word. Kitty recommends this practice tw two times a day, in the early morning and in the early evening. Now, our, our lives may not offer us um, the opportunity to use this method of prayer twice a day. But if we can find a place of privacy and a time of quiet in our lives once a day for 20, for 20 minutes, most days of the week, um, that's the optimal use of our, of our use for this practice. And Keating says that it takes 20 minutes to begin to, begin to sense this presence and to, be sense the, to begin to sense the prayer working. And as I said, over time, um, the practice deepens and we draw closer into relationship with God. We will find over time that past experiences from our lives bubble up, and we note their presence with interest. If there are emotions that come forward, we allow ourselves to feel those emotions, and then we return to our prayer. We don't think on it, we don't reflect on it. We return to our prayer. And um, Keating called this God's psychotherapy. Over time, we become more aware of God's presence within us. We develop a proud, profound sense of God's peace. And it's a fascinating and comforting process in which we are held by God. Through centering prayer, we allow God to purify us and draw us from, away from those experiences of our lives that... that um, that come between us and our relationship with God. Jesus said the kingdom, the realm of God, is within us, and this is what we seek to discover. Cynthia Bourgeau, an Episcopal, pri Episcopal priest who was part of that group that Keating gathered in Snowmass, um, writes in her book, The Wisdom Jesus, that rather than being about stilling the, mon the monkey mind, which I've discussed in the first two series uh, of this video series, um, this kind of prayer is about three things. First, the intent to be deeply available to God. Second, letting go of any thoughts that come into the mind. And third, the practice of returning to by that word um, of prayer whenever like our mind is, uh, strays, whether it's for dinner or whether it's for a substantial thought. A small book, The Human Condition, labeled as written by Thomas Keating, encompasses a series of lectures that he gave uh, at Harvard about centering prayer. Another one of his books, Open Mind, Open Spirit, and Bourgeau's book are all to be found in the um, in the, in the bibliography that accompanies um, the printed material that accompanies this video series. It's important, though, that we are not put off by minutia, by minutia of these books about the process that we are undertaking. This is a simple approach to prayer and one that will bear incredible fruit. The second type of prayer that we're considering is praying with nature. Praying with nature encompasses knowing the peaceful rhythm of the waves, the beauty of the flower it opens, of the majesty of the mountains. It includes mountaintop experiences, 
where, where we are filled with awe and thanksgiving floods our minds. The mountains. The sunset at the beach. A fresh snowfall. What mountaintop experiences do you recall? I grew up on the water, swimming, rowing, sailing. I was very allergic to poison ivy, as was, as was my mother, so our family life was not fo focused on the woodlands, on camping. It was focused on the water. And I wasn't aware of the extraordinary gifts of the woodlands until I came upon the poetry of Mary Oliver. You may be familiar with this poetry. Adam read from a poem in a recent sermon. She writes that her uh, approach to poetry, to writing poetry, is intentionally simple, to use as few words as possible. And I commend the breadth of her poetry to you. I'd like to read you this one published in her book, Why I Wake Early. It's called Mindfulness. Every day I see or hear something that more or less kills me with delight, that leaves me like a needle in the haystack of light. It was what I was born for, to look, to listen, to lose myself inside this soft world, to instruct myself over and over in joy and acclamation. Nor am I talking about the exceptional, the fearful, the dreadful, the very extravagant, but of the ordinary, the common, the very drab, the daily presentations. Oh, good scholar, I say to myself, how can you help but, go, but grow wise with great teachings? With such teachings as these. I'd like to read you this one published in her book, Why I Wake Up Early. It's called Mindful. Every day I see or hear something that more or less kills me with delight, that leaves me like a needle in the haystack of light. This is what I was born for, to look, to listen, to lose myself inside this soft world, to instruct myself over and over in joy and acclamations. Nor am I talking about the exceptional, the dreadful, the very fearful, the very extravagant, but of the ordinary, the common, the very drab, the daily presentations. Oh, good scholar, I say to myself, how can you help but grow wise with such teachings as these? The untrimmable light of the world, the ocean shine, the prayers that are made out of grass. Oliver named the prayer mindful and mindfulness, focusing on the experience of the present, are words that hold meaning in our lives today, especially in this time of anxiety and fear of the future. Oliver is approaching prayer as we might approach much in our daily lives. In this kind of prayer, we pay attention to the details of daily life. If we go for a walk, we look carefully at a flower, its color, its shape, the bruise of the broken petal. Or we see a butterfly and we watch it as it carefully moves from one resting place to another. When our minds are focused on the details, that whirling wheel of thoughts of concerns has no room to spin and we can sense that peace, the fullness, that is God's presence. And you can see how this is different from centering prayer, where the focus is on the word and returning to the word when thoughts come from deep within us 
into our minds, letting them go and returning to the word. Here we focus on the details and that whirling is stilled and we can feel God's presence. We can sense that peace, that fullness, that is God within us. This kind of prayer, praying in the world of nature, has many applications in our lives. In our daily lives, we can do things like focus on the dish that we're watching, washing on the pot that we're scrubbing. And if we focus on the details of those actions, we can feel that peace. For weeding in our garden, look carefully at our hands as they identify our weed, as they wrap our fingers around it, pull it up, and then place it aside. If we're shucking oysters in a quiet place, or we're arranging flowers. We focus entirely on that present action, not to the last or the next action. We are praying. We're not discovered. We're not distracted. And we discover God. And if our mind wanders, we bring it gently back um, to the detail of our actions. Thich Nhat Nhat Han in The Miracle of Mindfulness writes, I like to walk alone on country paths, rice plants, and wild grasses on both sides, putting each foot down on the earth in mindfulness, knowing that I walk on the wondrous earth. In such moments, existence is a miraculous and mysterious reality. People usually consider walking on water or in thin air a miracle. But I think the real, the real miracle is not to walk either on, either on water or in thin air, but to walk on earth. We can also pray with an object, with an object from nature, a flower, a leaf, a shell, a rock. And last week, I spoke about how to enter into meditation with scripture. This time, I'd like to lead you through a meditation and um, the instructions for this meditation and for centering prayer are found in the printed material that is found uh, below where you clicked on this video or also in the, um, on the webpage of St. Stephen's Episcopal Church under communications. And I think that what I'll do is end um, the active part of this video now, and then we'll move into that guided meditation. So if you'd like to take part in that meditation, stay with the video after our closing prayer. Now, next week, we'll be looking at icons, depictions of Jesus and the saints, and of stories from the Bible in both the Old and New Testaments, the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. And they're in, believed to embody the holy. They come to us from the Orthodox branch of Christianity and are created in a unique way um, that, that um, elevates their sacredness. And praying with them is an important way to pray without words. And we'll also look at the history and use of labyrinths as the pathway into an experience of God, and I'll talk about some that can be found in our local area that you may use um, when, if you find in them a place where there's sufficient distancing and um, for you to have um, a prayerful experience. So let us close with prayer. God of grace and love, we know that your power working in us can do more than we might ever ask or imagine. Assist us with your grace, that we may grow in our knowledge of you and of ourselves, grow in our love of you and our ability to love others, grow in our knowledge of your presence in our lives and in the lives we serve. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I hope that you have an object from nature that you can hold in your hand for this guided meditation. A flower, a shell, a leaf, a rock, or if you don't have an object from nature, something else 
that you can hold in your hand is a possibility as well. Now let us begin with a brief prayer. O oh God, we cannot see you. You are not to be seen, nor hear you. You are not to be heard. You are beyond the furthest reach of our imaginations, and yet you are here with us now. We give these next few minutes back to you who gave them to us. Amen. And so I, I hope that you'll spend the next few moments in a posture that you find comfortable so that you can be both relaxed and alert. Your feet on the ground, your body erect, your hands resting on your thighs, and you become now aware of your breathing, that you breathe in slowly, and then you breathe out. You follow your breath in through your nasal passages, down into your lungs, your breath expand your lungs, and then breathing out. Breathing in. And breathing out. As you breathe in, think that you're breathing in all the goodness and love of God. And as you breathe out, thinking that, think about breathing out all that separates you from God. And now, begin to relax your body. If there are places of tension in your head, in your scalp, in your jaw, relax those places. And then move on to your neck and your shoulder. Intentionally relax those places. And then your upper arms, your lower arms, your hands. And then relax any tension in your torso, in your hips, your thighs and knees, your lower legs and your feet. And feel the floor under your feet. And know that you are resting on holy ground. Tell God what is the grace that you desire from this time of prayer. Spend some minutes observing that object in your hand. Relax and enjoy this time. Forget everything else and concentrate on observing everything about the object that you can. Discover how it feels, smells, and looks from all angles. Observe its colors, its structure, its sections. Feel its weight, its texture. Does it have a smell? Does it make a sound?
Now spend some time reflecting on the observations that you've made. From observing in a factual way, move on into your imagination. Think over uh, the observations that struck you most strongly. Something that surprised you or puzzled you or came back into your mind repeatedly. And then choose about three of these observations and list them in your mind. And then think about what they suggest to you about human life, about yours in particular, about anyone's human, anyone's life. Do they suggest something about relationships, about God, about work or play, about joy or suffering? Anything about the way we live our lives or we might live our lives. You may want to look at the object as you think um, about these observations, and, um, or you may want to put it down. Think of those observations that you chose and the meanings they suggest. Which one carries a message for you? Which observation and related thought came home most fully to you, or most strongly or repeatedly? Sometimes um, it can be very obvious. Other times it's not so clear. Don't make up your mind by deciding what you ought to be thinking about, but choose because you seem drawn to choose. You don't have to be logical if something caught your attention strongly, but it seems to bear no relation to your life. Go ahead and pick it. And if no one observation stands out, pick one at random. What message does this observation and its related thought have for you.
to close your prayer, spend some moments in silence thinking of some small act that you can do in the next 24 hours that will be a token of the message that you've received. It could be as small as sending a postcard or making a phone call. When your prayer has ended, give thanks to God. You shift your posture and reflect for a few, for a few minutes on uh, what you've been feeling or sensing or what intuition has come to you in the course of your prayer. Amen. Oh,